Hi, everyone. Welcome to the July 13, 2022 meeting of the Amherst Massachusetts Conservation Commission. Um, Aaron, can you make me a co-host? I don't Yes. Sorry. Sorry, just dealing with some. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so we, I see we already have a fair number of people in attendance early in the meeting. So <clears throat> I'm gonna quickly, and I'll try to announce this um, throughout the meeting. Commissioners remind me if I don't, but if you are in attendance tonight um, for the hearing about the notice of intent at 52, or at the applicant is SWCA for 52 Fearing Street LLC, but the notice of intent is for work proposed at 46 Fearing Street. That will continue. We will not discuss that application tonight. Similarly, we will continue the hearing that is um, SWCA on behalf of Ron Laverdier um, until our next meeting. So we will only have one hearing tonight that will be discussed by the commission and that is um, 51 Spalding Street. Uh, so again, if you're here for 46 Fearing Street or 395 West Street, those um, projects will not be heard tonight. Um, if you are a butter, I think you probably already would have been notified for previous meetings for those um, hearings and you won't be notified again. Um, so the best thing you can do is keep an eye on the agendas posted before the next meeting. Our next meeting is uh, July 27th, Wednesday, July 27th. Um, so keep an eye on our website for the posted agenda to see what time the hearings will be um, for those projects at the next meeting. Yeah, and I can just say off the top that um, 395 West Street will be at 710 and, um, or I'm sorry, 710. Um, yeah. Bear with me for just a second. Um, 740 and then, um, Faring Street will be on at 745 at the next at the next meeting. Um, that's when they'll be scheduled. So there, yeah, at the earliest. Correct. Yep. All right. So the first item on our agenda is comments from the chair. Those are my main comments. Um, we only have one hearing. Um, that's a continuation from our last meeting tonight. That's 51 Spalding Street. Um, there's a oh, there's like not a ton of other business, but a couple of land use applications and a couple other correspondence issues to discuss, commissioners. But um, I think if we are efficient, we should be. I don't know. I'm going to drink this, but I'm going to go where <laughs> that we won't have too long of a meeting tonight. Um, aside from that, like Aaron continues to do a lot of work online and offline um, for the commission. I know that she's had an incredible workload lately, so. Um, extra thanks from me to, to Aaron. I um, can't believe how professionally you manage all this and how knowledgeable you are and how kind of fundamental it is to everything you do that we protect our wetland resources in Amherst. So super appreciative of that as a commissioner and the commissioner on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, with that, I know Dave, I think is either traveling or on vacation, so he won't be here tonight. Um, so yeah, we have two land management updates. Do you want to start there, Aaron? I ask a question. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, we're are we so we're going to be in person uh, um, starting next meeting. Is that the deal? Well, it depends. Um, uh, there is legislation pending through, I believe, the state budget to extend the remote meetings, and okay. I am really. It, what's really kind of cool, we we are the only, I think, committee in town who's managed to skirt meeting in person just because of our meeting schedule. So this is really interesting. So the mm. 15th of this month is the day I have to post our legal ads for the 27th. And so the day I post our ads, I'll know if the legislation is continued. So that's really good because if, the leg if we know on the 15th the legislation's been extended, I can just schedule us virtually. If it hasn't been at that point, then the meeting on the 27th will be in person. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess stay tuned on that. Um, do any other commissioners have any announcements? I should ask this at the top of the meeting or questions. Oh. Yep, Fletcher. Oh. And uh, I am um, happy to, I don't wanna take anybody's thunder, but I'm happy to be take uh, vice chair 
if you need be. Awesome. Oh yeah, you weren't here in the last meeting and we like volunteered you. That's right. Well, we heard that, but I wasn't there when Leroy left. I didn't know he left. Yeah, I know. A few meetings ago. So um, um, I'm happy to fill that role if, uh, yeah. So I'm happy to do that. Okay. Got it. Do you want to just, somebody want to just make a motion? And oh, I move that we <laughs> nominate Fletcher Clark for vice chairman. Second. Second for Michelle. Voice vote. <laughs> Andre. Aye. Aye. Larry. Aye. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. And I'm an aye. Thank you, Fletcher. That's awesome. Hey, thanks for the vote of confidence, everybody. I appreciate that. It makes me feel good. Thanks for stepping up, Fletcher. Yeah. Seconded. Does anyone else have any kind of procedural questions or scheduling questions or? comments. Um, as a reminder, I guess, while you guys think about that, we have another meeting in July. So we have a July 27th meeting. Sorry, I'm looking at my calendar really quick. And then we'll have our first meeting in August. So that's August 10th, but then we will not having a meeting on the 24th. So there will be no Conservation Commission meeting on August 24th. So after the 24th, it's quite a break. We'll pick it up again um, boy, on September 14th. Just so you guys have that on your calendars. Anyone else? Any other procedural comments, questions, scheduling things? Seems like no. All right. Um, land use at the top. I'm just pulling up errands. Oh, you dropped it. Yeah, so we have, oh, it's not in the presentation. Sorry, I just getting an agenda. First one is the Janet Planet um, land use application for Mount Pollux. And I believe it was the last meeting um, that the producers joined. Were they planning on joining again for this meeting, Erin, do you know? Um, I believe they are. Okay. Oh, there's Meredith. Uh, promotes a panelist. And Audrey, gotcha. Oh, geez, I just did the wrong one, sorry. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, Meredith, give me two seconds. I'm just trying to get Audrey in. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Audrey. Hello. Hi, I'm in a basement on our set, so <laughs> we are on location. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, so do you guys want to give us just, if you wouldn't mind, just please briefly introducing yourselves and then giving us kind of a three minute update of where we've moved since we last heard from you. I mean, you gave us a very good overview of kind of the knowns and the known unknowns at our last meeting. I don't think any other concerns have emerged, um, but if you wouldn't mind just giving us a brief update, that would be great. Um, we can go from there. Commissioners, there's a letter in our packets that, or I guess in our OneDrive folder um, that you could look at at the same time. Mm -hmm. Meredith, do you wanna jump in and lead? Yeah. Yes, can everybody hear me? Sorry, I have a little. Yes. Late. Okay, great. Um, thank you for having us at your meeting. Um, we're excited about the possibility. Um, and just a quick recap, um, we are hoping to film at Mount Pollux on um, Monday, August 15th, and Tuesday, August 16th. The approximate times are 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, we would not be able to film in the rain, so we had our proposed rain dates of uh, the 22nd and the 23rd. Um, we did talk about um, the challenges of um, access because there is just that, there's that small parking lot there um, and that we would um, on the second day also like to be filming in that parking lot. Um, but even if we weren't, you know, we realized that um, it could be tight um, if anyone from the public wanted to come up. So what we talked about doing was um, hiring um, police to be stationed at the bottom of that hill um, that drives up 
um, to the parking lot, just mostly for safety concerns, because um, even if we put a sign, someone it might not catch it the way that road is and might try to pull up and then there could be sort of a traffic jam, someone trying to back out. So we figured if they see the, the officer's car there, um, that'll just help us with safety. Um, we also discussed um, the fact that uh, we know that folks um, could enter in from different paths and you know the public could, would come by. Um, so we have production assistants with us um, that would politely ask them um, to hold for a moment if our camera happened to be rolling and then let them pass through. Audrey, am I forgetting anything? Uh, no, I do know that I did want to address, I think last time we met, there was a question about a generator or, or you know, or a food truck. Um, and just wanted to reiterate that our, um, our footprint out Mount, at Mount Pollux will be much smaller than it is at our other sets. We're, we're trying to keep it as skeleton as possible. It's the term we use a skeleton crew. So, while our bigger crew is 60 to 70, we're keeping it to 25 to 30, only essential people. Um, we will not have our regular generator on site because we don't have a huge amount of electric needs. It's outside, um, you know, it, they're just gonna be working with a, a lot of available light, they're just going to bring um, all to bring what we call putt putt generators. So small generators that we can like keep down in the lot. Um, and they'll be using we'll be using power off of that. We won't um, we won't have a huge um, we won't have a catering truck there. We'll have like a, like I think we mentioned like a table for craft service, like a little pop up table. And we did let everyone know on our technical survey, our tech scout that they um, that they are not allowed anywhere that's off the path. And we made it very clear to everyone on our scout that this is a conservation and you have to respect. And, you know, I think everyone was really, you know, fine with that and, and understood. And uh, we have a super pro crew who's, who's gonna, who's gonna respect that. Um, so I think, I think that kind of addresses some of the main questions that were brought up last time. Appreciate that, Audrey. Thank you. Um, and I see in the letter of intent that you guys are making a um, donation to the town of Amherst Conservation Commission, which is just the town of Amherst in the end, in the amount of um, $1,500 per day of filming. So that's totally $3,000, which um, we really appreciate. That goes right back into all the trails and maintenance for us. Absolutely. Um, and the parent and me can't help but mention that there is a ton of poison ivy off trail there. Um, so just like literally growing over the edges of the trail. <laughs> we um, noticed that and we, okay. we had a little, we have a little like tick and poison ivy memo that goes out with our call sheets or with our um, emails. So we've, we have, we have let everyone know that we have a lot of locations where we're having to be extra vigilant about uh, poison ivy and ticks, but yeah. thank you. For, <laughs> I just want to interject yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. No yeah. Problem. Um, so I'm supportive of this application, commissioners. I think that um, the applicant has gone, you know, has gone above and beyond in terms of communication and being flexible and responding to the concerns we raised. Um, but I want to give you guys a chance to ask any questions or raise any concerns. Um, so Michelle, I see you have your hand up. Yeah. So I don't. I mean, I, they, it seems like ecologically, you know, impacts are being minimized, and I don't have any concerns about that. I do have concerns about um, restricting access to the parking lot, which is part of the, the application, um, which I don't think is something we've ever done before. And I guess I have concerns about precedent and equity here. So, you know, in terms of the opportunity for other members of the community to ever do this, um, it's not something we've opened up to our community before. But I think that if, you know, members of our public Amherst community knew that you know, for $1,500, they could have exclusive access to the parking lot at Mount Pollux. That would be a pretty popular option for weddings in Amherst. So my concern is just setting a precedent for allowing, you know, a pay for exclusive access to the parking lot at Mount Pollux. And if we're going to start allowing this opportunity to other people, if they request it, for example, if next week someone wanted to have a wedding up there and they offered us $2,000 to have the parking lot, are we going to 
are we going to say yes? Are we opening the door for that? Um, like what, what road are we going down by allowing this for the first time? Um, I, I can just sort of, you know, address that from our, from our standpoint. Um, yeah, I don't know what will be known to the public about this, but I do think, um, maybe there's something that could be put in writing on our end, or maybe there's something that we could make it known that this is a, that this is, I don't know, that this is maybe not about the money, that this is a case by case basis. And it's also because Annie is from Amherst and it's maybe more of a, you know, a culturally specific thing to the area and more about the, um, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I understand your concern fully and well. Um, it's um, just one of those things that, you know, I don't know how we would be able to do it without access to the lot, unfortunately. So in the past, when people want weddings, which is normally what they want to do, we say the parking lot is going to be open to the public and we're not going to restrict access. And if you want the parking lot, get there early, save your parking spot and just kind of reserve it with your own vehicles. And, and that's how we get around helping people um, find their place without really restricting it to the community. But like commissioners, currently the policy for land use at Mount Pollux is to review them on a case by case basis. And we've never restricted access for the public before. So, you know, unless we're like pursuing some different route for fundraising, you know, through pay for exclusive access, like I don't, I, like for next week, like what if a native, um, you know, a third generation Amherstite wanted to have a wedding up there and they are willing to pay $2,000. Are we now gonna allow that? Like, it, I just, I don't, I don't wanna be short sighted in, in how we evaluate this particular application. I don't necessarily have a problem with the application of itself. You know, I went to school with Annie, but, but I just wanna, like keep in mind equity for our community members. And I'm, I'm just interested in everyone else's opinion on this because we are undergoing a land use applicate, you know, a land use policy revisions. And this is probably something we need to think about. Like, um, are we are we gonna open a store for Mount Pollux? I mean, I think oh, that- Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. sorry. I, if, I, if I could chime in, um, we, we considered this a donation as a, as a thank you and as, because we do wanna support the mission and we do believe in it being available to the public. Um, and we just, what you said about um, if we just showed up there early, um, we would just fill the parking lot and we didn't know if that was okay for us to do. And so my concern would be more if we did do that, I was just worried about creating a disturbance in the community when people tried to come in up that up that drive. We wanted to make sure that it didn't cause any dangerous traffic jams if someone had to back out that road. Um, so, uh, so I guess my two points are one is that um, we didn't necessarily see this as as purchasing the ability to use the drive, the parking lot more as a gesture of thank you for all of the work that people are from the conservation committee need to put in to help us to organize. Um, and just as a support of, of the, the mission, um, if that makes any difference. And I, I also, I, 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 there's a, I think that your points are very valid and make a, they really make a good point because you have, a, you have a mission here, which we support. So hopefully we can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, I appreciate this. I see your hands up, Aaron. Just give me two secs. I just wanna say, so to your earlier point, <clears throat> Audrey, all of this is public. So the letter of intent, was is made public um, and this conversation is public. So just so you know, like the, the donation and the, the everything in there is already public information. This is not a surprise. Um, and I do appreciate the distinction between a fee and donation. Um, I think that's an important one. Erin, sorry, uh, um, Andre, give me a second. Erin had her hand up and I'm thinking maybe she has some facts to help us here. No, I just had a question. So like, it, let's say you guys arrived at like 6 a.m. in the morning and there was three cars there and people were hiking or walking. Like what would happen then? I guess just logistically kind of if there was cars there the day yeah. you were filming in the parking lot and they they were like walking down at um, Atkins Flats, like across the street and were hiking for the day or something. How would how would I mean, that be? 
We would just have to, we would just have to adjust. Um, we would have to make sure that, you know, we weren't blocking them in and that we could, you know, and, and this, and if this is the case where we wouldn't be allowed to sort of um, necessarily keep it, you know, block it off and tell the public they can't come in, if it is this case where we are just getting there early and taking up the spots, um, then we would readjust, we would adjust a little bit and um, perhaps reduce our crew even more. Um, because my concern would be we don't want anyone to get blocked in. <laughs> um, and then if we don't have the equipment that we need to do um, to finish the work that we're doing, um, we would just have to get our team together and see if we can reduce that and see if it's still possible for us to film at Mount Pollux um, with a even more reduced um, amount of equipment and people. Um, and just to be clear too, we, we wouldn't bring any um, any cars up there. We were gonna park our crew elsewhere and then just drop them off and they would walk, walk in from the road. I just wanted to make that point in light of Michelle's comment, because like if somebody's there and they're using it, it's not like you're gonna arrive and be like, hey, whose car is this? You gotta leave. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like if no, somebody's no. there and they're using yeah. it and they're on the property, yeah. they're still using the property. So it's just, yeah. uh, just to show that people would, would still have access potentially if they got there early. Absolutely. And we, we would ask that, you know, if they happen to be walking um, past our camera and in our shot, we might, um, if this is, if this is all right, have a, you know, very polite, do you mind holding just while we're rolling and then we cut and that's only a minute or two. Um, but of course, if they're, if they're like, no, I'm going to rush and go through, then we'll let them through. Um, and, and thank you for that distinction, Erin, because you know, if we're talking about um, not, you know, sort of blocking off the the um, parking lot for our, our use, if it's more that we're just getting there early and, and using the lot, um, then we'll just have to know on our end to adjust if um, the lot isn't available when we show up. Um, and and we'll we'll talk on our end and see if that's feasible, if we can if we can still work under that circumstance. Andre, thanks for your patience. Uh, well, I think uh, Meredith just touched so slightly on uh, on my question. Um, how much of the time that you're going to be there do you expect to be filming and restricting, in essence, the uh, the passage of the public? That's a very good question. Um, a lot of the time that we're there, we're not rolling our camera. Mm -hmm. We're getting people into position. We're looking at the lighting, we're, you know, bringing um, whatever um, gear we need around. Um, we're having a stand-in there to see what they look like in the light and we're not actually rolling. Um, and then once we are rolling, it's not a very long time that we're rolling. It's short segments of shoot, cut, shoot, cut, shoot, cut. Um, so, you know, again, if someone were walking the path and we were asking them um, to hold that it's not, you know, half hour, it's not 20 minutes, it's not 10, it's really just while we're rolling. And I, I know that's not a very specific <laughs> answer, but. Well, well, but it does go to the, uh, to the, it, it does uh, provide some clarity in terms of uh, public access to, to the public uh, location. Um, and then just something, I'm throwing this out as a possible uh, solution, if you would, to, um, to the public parking and so on, or to the restriction of uh, parking is uh, perhaps uh, some kind of an arrangement that you could have with uh, with someone, some property owner nearby to shuttle people back and forth uh, or something like that. I don't wanna. We've already done that. Yeah, we've reached out to Hampshire College um, with that plan that we would we would put all of our people, park them there. We, we, they, we put them in a van, we drive them to the bottom of that driveway, we drop them off and they walk up. So we're not expecting any crew members to drive their personal cars there at all. So yeah, I got I got that part. Um, what I'm curious about is for the public who would who would. Oh, sorry. Place okay. to park. Um, yeah. The back to the the equity uh, issue that Michelle was uh, uh, was speaking to earlier. 
I see. And so you're saying that we would, and we've done this before at different locations before where we've provided um, parking for the public. If anyone wanted to comply and they couldn't get in, um, if there's some place nearby, is that that's what you're suggesting? Um, just, uh, yes, I'm throwing it out as an idea yeah. as, uh, that yeah. would resolve the issue of, uh, yeah. of uh, preventing the public from parking in the parking lot. Uh, yeah. There. Yeah, we've done that before in different locations, for sure. Um, we would provide that, you know, and, and and cover the cost of that and communicate to folks when they came by. Well, that might be a solution. Mm -hmm. So yeah, one idea yeah, is like South Amherst Common, there's park, a few parking spots there. So if okay. somebody was adamant about wanting to pull in, the police could say, go park at South mm -hmm. Amherst Common and somebody will come pick you up yeah. to come hike while this is being filmed just to like play that out that is one possible yeah yeah we can we can look into if that could um certainly the parking part the transportation for them um would be another logistical thing we'd have to put together with our we have very strict covid um protocols but we could we could work on that my parking spots are there five uh, at mount pollux mount pollux maybe maybe five four yeah between I'd say five or six, I think last when I was there, I There's counted. No yeah. yeah, yeah, probably probably about six. Yeah, it's pretty small. And if you have like a truck or an SUV there, it's far less because yeah. you can't like, get out. And then equipment. I mean, honestly, I don't. I mean, guys, you you close the place off. If we're if we're gonna do this, you just close it off. You're gonna have the police there. It's gonna be safer. But we're not. That I guess we're not concern. there yet. But we're talking about like safety here too. Like that road stinks. Like that sight line is terrible coming in and out of there just another thing to throw at it but and you guys need the whole parking lot right if you want to do this you pretty much need the whole parking lot for your for your equipment we do and um and the safety issue so, was the reason why we wanted to have a police officer on, well, to the have, bottom, on allow the it to allow the public to kind of come as it in and out as they go we're only talking about a couple spots here i understand allowing access it's, when I was talking about the public, I, to be clear, sorry, I meant pedestrians who might come in yeah. from other trails. Um, we we were we had the same concern about safety, and that was why we suggested that we would have a police officer yeah. on the street. Because when you come down that turn, it's it's hard to yeah. see you know, and they might try to pull in. So if they see a police officer vehicle there, they'll realize something's going on, and they won't just pull right in. Yeah, I think that if the drive in wasn't so narrow and so steep, this would be a different conversation altogether. We're clearing another, um, we're working with Chesterfield Gorge for a totally different scene. And it's a bigger parking lot and there's another lot nearby and there's better access and it's just a different conversation altogether. Um, uh, so, and then we may not even actually end up, that's, I shouldn't know if I should say that we may not even end up there actually, but, um, but, you know, we, we have like experience with, um, different parks, but this one is just so specific in terms of safety concerns, I think, mm -hmm. and just access and like having someone drive up and not having a place to turn around or to, you know, I mean, we're, if we're pushing a, a you know, I don't know if we're, if we're moving equipment and, you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, I see hands are stacking up. Um, Michelle, just before we get into this again, so if if it were possible to, if you were a member of the public and you wanted to drive to Mount Pollux, um, but the parking lot was being used for filming, not for parking, but just for equipment for filming, and they drove up to the entrance and the policeman was like, I'm sorry, like the parking lot is full of equipment. Can you please go park at South Amherst Common? And the crew was able to then figure out how to shuttle the members of the public back so that they could walk around Mount Pollux. Do you think that that would address the equity concerns or is that too complicated or not sufficient? It's definitely complicated, but um, it, it does get to addressing it. I, my, my main concern is just um, saying that we're shutting down the parking lot for this event because I don't want to I don't want to do that for a single event and I, I definitely hear the public safety concern and I'm thinking maybe just like a sign at the beginning that says like large truck and equipment like be careful up ahead because Matt Pollock's is always like that you know on a Friday it's like sketchy so 
um, you know, maybe some forewarning before could the we, public drives yeah. up. Could we phrase it as temporary, temporarily relocating Mount Palix parking to the South Amherst Common so that unfortunately the parking is not adjacent to Mount Pollux, but there would be a way to get people from this temporary relocation of the parking to the Mount Pollux conservation area. I'm just trying to find like a, I'm here. I understand. I mean, I guess I just want to throw out the hypothetical that like, you know, next week, like a, you know, three generation Amersite comes and wants to get married up there and is willing to donate $2,000 commission for the same thing. Are we just, are we just going to do it like every weekend through the wedding season? Like I just, want to be sure that we're thinking ahead on this one. Um, like I, I see where you're trying to find compromise and I, you know, if we're not shutting it down, I guess I'm happy to move forward, but like, I just want everybody to consider that, you know, if people knew that this was an option, they'd probably take advantage of it pretty regularly. Um, okay. So I think Aaron, do you, I wanted to get an idea of like where everyone is on this and if there's more information that people need in order to move forward because I'm cognizant of the fact that we've been talking about this for 20 minutes and we have a full agenda. Um, so was that your reminder, Aaron? I just wanted to state one thing, which is Mount Pollux is always first come first serve. If they arrive and there's people there, there's people there. They're, if, they're, if they arrive first and they stake out the parking lot, it's first come first serve. So we're not kicking anybody out. We're not telling anybody they can't access it. They're, it's first come first serve. So I don't see if we condition it as such that it's just treating them exactly as anybody else. There's just a donation coming along with it. If, if we were saying public access restricted today, you can't park here because the parking lot's closed, that's a different story. But I mean, I, I'm just trying to like separate the fact that it's first come first serve all the time. So if somebody drove up there to walk and there was five cars in the parking lot, they're turning around and leaving because they don't have access to Mount Pollock. So if they get there at 5 a.m. and they stake out the parking lot, then, you know, just putting that out there to consider. Yeah, so the application asks for restricted access, the parking lot or exclusive access. So that's that's my only thing that if we just approve it like as is, it's not necessarily a first come first serve. I'm totally fine with first come first serve, which is what we do for every single application. Right. And I just wanted to get back to the fact that when I asked them initially, are you going to be kicking people out if they're in the parking lot when you arrive? They just said they would adjust their plan to accommodate the fact that there's cars there. So I just want to make sure because that's essentially treating them equally as other folks who use the land. Um. I think that, you know, given what we've discussed about the first come first serve scenario, I think Meredith, I don't know about you, but I, we could look into, we could readjust our letter of intent to have different language regarding the parking lot. Yeah. I do still just want to make sure we're safe with if people are driving up I think that's still the concern that there's nowhere to turn around um well I think that's a public safety question for the police so yeah. like my recommendation would be we approve it and state in the conditions it's always been first come first serve just as we do for weddings and any other occasion get there early stake it out um, you can, you know, put up signage just like people do for weddings, just like people do for other events on the place, as long as you're cleaning that up at the end of the day or at the end of the show. Um, and then work out the safety issue with the public safety department who's in charge of keeping the roadway safe, because ultimately that's a question for the police department, not for the conservation commission to me anyway, but I just, just trying to hash it out and keep us on track yeah uh, and, and in terms of let me just throw this out in terms of uh back back to uh the michelle's concerns in terms of um the application uh stating that it uh, that that you're looking for restricted ask, uh access uh how about we uh you either change that um restricted access uh to not uh request that or in the conditions, uh, we condition it that, uh, or we specify that 
access will not be restricted. And then, um, you know, in terms of public safety, that's a whole other story. Um, that's just what Aaron said. I, I'm sorry? That's just what Aaron said. And I agree with what Aaron said. And, and uh, Aaron, yeah, Aaron said something about the end of what I just said. The, in terms of the application, seeing uh, uh, they've applied for restricted access, and that uh, and uh, just approving it straight up uh, would perhaps set a precedence that we don't want. Um, well, so those well, but, two, but, two but, items but, I mentioned. But we so, may, we approve it. We approve it on the basis of what Aaron said and negate what it said in their request. So I just We're want to clarify the same that. thing then. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Let's, I think go, let's go to hand raising, please. Um, commissioners, if you have a comment, sorry, go ahead, Aaron. I was just gonna say, generally when we have these applications, we have conditions that we list and we have a whole slew of conditions like you can't leave trash, um, you can't damage the, you know, you can't damage the ground, leave disturbance. Um, so I would suggest that we have a condition, the parking lot is first come first serve. So get there early and stake it out. That's what we tell everybody who has weddings there, that we have a condition that states, you know, access isn't restricted to the public. We appreciate the fact that you've offered to notify people if you're filming, you know, and letting people know if they're trying to pull in the parking lot, et cetera, what's going on with signage, and then to coordinate with public safety to make sure that whatever is going on with the driveway access is done so safely so no one's injured. I think that is a great path forward. Is that, go ahead, of the thumbs up for me. Larry, Fletcher, Michelle, all right. Is that, I'll copacetic with you guys, Meredith and Audrey. It seems like that's a good workable, hopefully. It sounds workable to us. You guys must be logistics experts. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're like, yeah. That's the... <laughs> so it motion. sounds like we need a Yes. Yeah, I'll make a motion to accept the land use uh, filming. Application for Janet. application as long as we follow the conditions that we were just discussed about allowing first come first serve, allowing access, and working with a public safety officer to ensure full safety standards. I'll second that. Second. <laughs> Got a second from Andre. Voice vote, Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Larry. Aye. And I'm an I. Thank you, Meredith and Audrey. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you for your thank time. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Second land use application. Drum roll. Wedding at Mount Pollock. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see. This should be the exact same conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I wonder if they were listening. Um, is, do you know if this person was planning on attending Aaron by any chance? or They anyone? were Chad at the top, Chad Howard. Chad. He's already heard all our conditions. I know, I hope he's- <laughs> Makes this one easier. See, it took a little longer on the front end, a little shorter on the back end, right? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, hi Chad. Great. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, it, Mount Pollux is a, a wonderful little spot. And I, I from the last uh, half hour, I've, everyone's aware that it's a, everyone here at least is aware that it's a wonderful little spot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before we even jump into it, I'm, I'm looking at your application. I don't see any red flags. Our usual caveats are that there's we can't we can't restrict public access, so you have to be ready for that. There's very little parking. We recommend a shuttle, some sort of shuttle setup. Often people use parking at South Amherst Common or some other place and then shuttle people up. Um, there are invasives, including poison ivy, um, and anything that you bring in, bring out, um, and try to stay on the pads and kind of minimize footprint is usually our, our big concerns. Um, is that okay on your end? Do you see any concerns accommodating that? 
No, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, we, we uh, as far as parking, we're, we're aware of the limitations. We, um, we're not intending to use the parking lot at all. Um, perhaps the, the bride uh, may pull up if she's able or she might get dropped off at the bottom of the hill. Um, but we, we have um, arranged since my application, we were planning on shuttling from a, a other location, but we actually have arranged uh, with a resident on Blossom Lane to allow us to park on their property. Um, so uh, we feel like we have a pretty good parking uh, situation and um, guests will be able to walk up one of the paths from Blossom Lane side of the property. Um, and yeah, no, as far as uh, cleaning up after ourselves, we, we, we plan on bringing nothing, um, a few benches uh, for a few people to sit down, particularly uh, a couple older people that, are, that will be attending and maybe a small PA system battery operated with a, a Bluetooth microphone. And that's it, no decorations, no flowers, no arch, no equipment, no, just, it's pretty simple. Okay. Um, commissioners, any additional concerns or comments? Chad, did you hear everything that we discussed earlier? I, I was here. I was here. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're looking for a motion. I'll make that motion to allow Chad. Chad, do you want to get married? I am. Yes. yes. Uh, of course. September September eighteenth. All, All right. There you go, man. Um, uh, I uh, move to accept the uh, wedding uh, land use application for wedding on Mount Pollux on September 18th. Second. Okay, voice vote, Michelle. Aye. Audrey. Oh, sorry. Andre. Aye. Larry. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. And I'm an aye. Hey, also, just a good job on trying to find that. Uh, Got that person on Blossom Lane too. So yeah, that's yeah, very helpful. And obviously, gonna make us feel a little bit better. It was going to be a. It was the one point of um, struggle to get people there, really. And and as as we have well uh, discussed tonight, so um, yeah, it worked out really well. Thank you. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I ask uh, what happens from here? Do I wait for a permit or? You'll get a permit. It'll come directly to your email. It'll just be. Um a document that you can print out and it will list similarly the the conditions we discussed um and just you can um you know generally like if for example folks are stargazing at night we recommend putting the permit in their car window um but in this case since you're not relying on the parking lot you don't have to really worry about that at all beautiful thank you mm -hmm. thank you very much everybody have a good night, Chad. Take care. All right. So I think we, I'm just going to get back to the agenda quickly. Yeah. So we're well past time when we can move to our, our to our only hearing. And I just want to take a second and make an announcement. Um, if you weren't here at the top of the meeting, but you've joined us since then, we will be continuing the hearings for um, the projects proposed at 46 Beering Street and 395 West Street. Um, so again, the hearing scheduled for today at 740 for the project proposed at 46 Beering Street will, will be continued. We will not discuss that project tonight. And further, the hearing scheduled for 745 um, for a project proposed at 395 West Street, we will not be discussing that project tonight, that proposed project tonight either. Um, so if you're here for those hearings, um, you are probably following the hearings, or if you were notified as a butter, you won't receive a formal notification again. Instead, you have to keep track of what time the hearings will be. It sounds like maybe they'll be scheduled for 7.30 and some, something meet adjacent soon after that on our next meeting night, which is July 27th. Um, so the best thing you can do is keep an eye on our website. Um, I think Aaron has to post the agenda by Friday, the 15th. Um, so keep an eye on our website, um, follow it, uh, log into that meeting to see if we're able to discuss those projects. So again, <laughs> 46 Fearing Street, 395 West Street, we're not discussing those projects tonight. All right, um, sorry for the delay. With that, um, 
we should uh, we can move to our notice of intent hearing that was scheduled for 7:35 for Berkshire Design Group on behalf of Bruce Allen and Car Carol Albano for the expansion of existing driveway and parking area and the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands at 51 Spalding Street. Um, so who is here? So probably Bruce Allen is my guess. Um, Bruce, I'm going to promote you to panelists. If you're here as um, an applicant or um, the rep applicant's representative, could you raise your hand so I can move you in as a panelist? I believe Doug is the representative, so I just put him in as panelist. Okay, thanks. And if anybody else is. I'm. Hi, Doug. Hi, thank you all. Was there anyone else like that I should bring in to be a panelist? Uh, no, it is uh, just myself from Berkshire Design Group. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, if uh, I could share, um, is that possible to do that? Yeah, I'm so actually, <clears throat> you can give me a couple. I just wanna line up how we usually do these hearings um, just sure. because it seems like we have a, Good amount of public interest. I just want to review this at the top. So, what we'll ask you to do is introduce yourself and give like a really a three to five minute overview of the project. Okay. Um, and then we will um, discuss the project, any additional information from staff or commissioners that were able to be there for a site visit and view any photos that Aaron might want to share. Um, and then we'll take public comment. So, that's um, questions and comments relevant to our jurisdiction on the project. We limit those usually to two to three, really two minutes, um, just so that we can move through and, and hear what everyone has to say. Um, and then we'll come back to the commission and ask any clarifying questions um, and make it very clear what we would need to move forward with um, the, the project or um, at that point condition and, and figure out a, a ruling on, on the project. Um, so that's kind of the arc of how we're going to do this. That's for your benefit, but also everyone here um, in the public. So, commissioners, did I miss anything about that? Okay. All right. So with that, um, yeah, Doug, if you could introduce yourself and give us an overview, that would be great. And you should be able to share your screen. Okay. Thank you. Going. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Doug Searle. I work with Berkshire Design Group. We're a civil engineering landscape architecture survey firm in Northampton. Uh, and uh, I am here tonight on behalf of Carol Albano and, and Bruce Allen, uh, uh, that are the uh, owners of uh, the, an owner occupied duplex at 51 Spalding Street in Amherst. It's approximately a, a half acre parcel. Um, and the owners are in the uh, process of uh, uh, applying to uh, construct uh, what a, uh, an additional set of parking spaces uh, to accommodate the residences for the two family duplex, as well as uh, two lodgers that are residing within the owner occupied dwelling. Uh, a component of the uh, uh, of the of the overall uh, uh, duplex. So uh, currently on the screen uh, is the existing conditions of the site. There's an existing um, uh, asphalt driveway that is on the south side of the parcel, and then this is the main uh, 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 building uh, with uh, the uh, two uh, family dwellings in it. Uh, to the north uh, east uh, side of the property, there were delineated wetlands. These were delineated by Wendell um, uh, Wetland Services in March of 2022. And um, uh, also shown on this map is the 25 foot uh, wetland uh, no build uh, buffer uh, as part of the um, uh, town's wetland protection uh, bylaw regulations. And then as yeah. well, the, 
Yes. So, sorry to interrupt you. Could you just find a way to like map zoom in a little bit? It's just really hard to see. Absolutely. Is that a little bit better? Um, a tiny bit more. Just I I just want people folks to be able to see that 25 foot buffer and the BBW. Yeah, perfect. That's that's great. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so uh, I'm going to move my mouse over uh, the area that was uh, delineated uh, wetlands, and then uh, there's a series of existing uh, vegetation, a uh, mix of native and, and uh, Japanese knotweed uh, variety, you know, certainly invasive. Um, and inside of that, there is an existing um, uh, maintained lawn area that's uh, been in existence for, for many years on the, on the site. Uh, and then on the southern edge of this uh, section of, of vegetation, there's a you know, series of herbaceous perennials and, and, and planted, um, maintained kind of garden beds that are, that are part of the residence landscape uh, that are a, a mix of uh, native, non-native uh, vegetation in this area. So what they are proposing, I'm gonna skip to the next slide here, the next uh, sheet that was part of this submission, there were uh, there was an, an initial submission, and this uh, was essentially the, the third uh, plan that was sent to Aaron um, uh, to distribute uh, to the commission. Uh, the reason for um, the kind of updated plans, the revised plans, the uh, as uh, we initially Berkshire Design Group started working with uh, Carol and Bruce. Uh, to assist them with this permitting process. Uh, we were aware that they wanted to apply for, uh, for uh, four additional parking spaces for the residents of the uh, two-family duplex. Uh, it came to our attention that they also had uh, lease agreements for two, uh, two roomers, two lodgers within the um, owner-occupied uh, uh, residence. Uh, and uh, it came also to the homeowners uh, uh, awareness that they needed to um, provide parking spaces for those residents as well. So the plan uh, increased from uh, having four uh, parking spaces uh, off the eastern end of the uh, existing driveway to uh, a, a request for uh, two parking spaces uh, that would be gravel parking spaces uh, within the front setback. So. Uh, suffice to say uh, that uh, all of this is in, in process uh, for uh, a special permit amendment with uh, the zoning board uh, of appeals. And so that um, uh, group is uh, going to be reviewing this in terms of, of how that relates uh, to the uh, uh, zoning regulations and requirements uh, for this parcel. Um, here tonight, uh, we uh, wanted to discuss the, um, the a small portion of this uh, four space gravel lot is um, within the 25 foot uh, no build wetland buffer. And so what we are here tonight to, to uh, is to say that that is part of the proposal and to say that we, that area is approximately 206 feet of of, of space uh, that um, would change from essentially lawn to uh, a gravel parking area. And to offset that, uh, we're proposing to plant six uh, native shrubs, uh, red osier dogwoods uh, uh, along the eastern edge of the, the terminus of this uh, proposed expanded driveway. Um, and uh, along with the learning of the two additional parking spaces, it, it came to the owner's attention that they needed to um, add in additional uh, uh, plantings to uh, try to minimize any um, like uh, lights from uh, headlights from these cars that would be uh, potentially intrusive to um, residents to the north. And so there are seven uh, swamp azaleas that are proposed. Uh, uh, in this area as well. So this would be essentially an enhancement. It is within the 25 foot uh, wetland buffer, but it is uh, an enhancement compared to the lawn that is uh, currently in existence there. So those are the uh, expanded uh, plantings that are in that area. So in terms of how that relates to the performance standards, uh, we find that there's, um, there's not any uh, 
there, we're not doing any work within the existing wetlands uh, uh, on site. And there's not a new, uh, really a new point source uh, discharge to this, any runoff from this gravel, uh, uh, any surface runoff that would, that would come off of this gravel uh, paved area is uh, intended to be directed uh, within the lot and uh, it, would, it would go across the existing vegetation on site and also would be further buffered by the uh, roots, you know, once these red osier dogwoods are established, that would that would certainly help to offset uh, and uh, capture filter any um, runoff that would come through in that area, and uh, and then the the uh, area of uh, uh, additional site. It's a pretty small project, so there it's it does not require um, uh, state stormwater. Uh, standards it doesn't need to apply for a stormwater report or st stormwater permit um, so essentially that's the um, that's the project okay thanks Doug um, and I appreciate how well delineated both BBW the resource and the buffers are in these plans as well as the specific call out to like exactly how many square foot footage we're talking about um, within the 25 foot buffer like I really appreciate the details being on the plans. Um, and I also just want to make a note at this point for the commission that because this um, permit was filed before we accepted the bylaw revisions, like really that 206 square foot listed within the 25 feet buffer, 25 foot buffer BBW is the only issue, thing at issue here. So like the old bylaws apply here, um, just so you guys are aware of that. Um, Aaron, did you have any photos or like any further info to share? Yes, yes, We're, I do. Um, should I, I can stop sharing or that maybe is not an issue. <laughs> <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> um, so this is, if you're standing in the existing driveway looking toward the wetland, um, and this is in the wetland itself looking down, or in the um, buffer looking down toward the wetland, you can see there's quite a bit of Japanese knotweed um, in that vegetated buffer. And then this is standing sort of behind the residence looking in the back. Again, a photo of the Japanese knotweed. Um, so I did work with um, Doug on a couple things. Um, the first revision was adding in the plantings um, and that was as well as being mitigation for the impact of the driveway, it was also, um, in my mind, a similar barrier that the commission has required along buffers to prevent encroachment of lawn or, you know, encroachment of driveway toward the wetland. So I think it's sort of twofold there as mitigation and also as a, a visual barrier. So that was added in. And obviously they've had to make other um, adjustments in terms of the plan and to accommodate um, the uses of the site. But I did put together um, recommended conditions and I'll just share those right now and run through them really quickly. And again, I know this is to just address some of the um, concerns that have come up in terms of um, site specific issues here. So sort of our standard boilerplate for residential projects under Wetlands Protection Act and our local bylaw, um, the Conservation Commission would only be approving work on the subject lot of this application. So um, the property boundaries should be clearly marked to prevent any inadvertent, unpermitted encroachment or impacts to the neighboring lot. Um, erosion and sediment controls around the proposed large parking area, I suggest be staked straw bales to really prevent any movement of material or encroachment during the construction of the larger parking area, and then stake straw wattles around the smaller parking area, which is further away from the wetland. Um, an, an erosion control inspection prior to the start of work, a pre-construction meeting with the contractor prior to the start of work. Um, parking and drainage runoff from the parking areas must be directed 
within the property itself and not graded to send runoff onto neighboring properties or to impact wetlands on neighboring properties. Um, and that if any runoff or erosion is shown moving towards wetlands on erosion uh, on neighboring properties, particularly just that little, there's like a little um, area where the wetland cuts up on the neighboring property, that is pretty much my area of concern that I'm worried about material moving toward. Um, so just to make sure that in the final grade that that's graded properly so that it's staying on site. Um, the, I would just, I added this condition that the Conservation Commission encourages hand cutting and appropriate removal of invasive species um, and bagging it and disposing it at a landfill, but that chemical treatment of the knotweed would require um, us to know about it and also a WM4 permit from DEP because it is um, in the wetland. Um, when fully stable, an erosion control or a, a, an inspection prior to removal of controls and then again only native plantings in the buffer zone and that 50% of the plantings must survive over a three year period which is pretty standard in our boilerplate. That is super thorough. Thank you, Erin. Hang on Fletcher, two seconds. Doug, was any of that a surprise or is, is that all okay with no you? not none of that is a surprise whatsoever i will uh add that the um the applicants have expressed interest in wanting to remove the japanese knotweed in this area and so uh this is very helpful to kind of clarify that if they're just removing it by hand uh that that's okay if they're wanting to do something a little more intensive that they need to submit a permit for that so i think that's very helpful to clarify how they can go about doing that great um, so Fletcher, do you have like a quick clarifying question for now, or were you getting into discussion of this? Because we do uh, stop the public comment. Okay, I can wait. Okay. Um, so members of the public, um, if you have any questions or comments relative to the jurisdiction of this commission about this application, so that is really um, the location of the additional parking um, relative to the BBW delineation, um, please raise your hand. And I would ask that we limit your comments or questions to two minutes and that you identify yourself and your address um, at the beginning of your comment or question. Um, we'd appreciate that. So Amy. Um, Amy, I just promoted you the panelist. Yes, hi, I'm Amy Gates. I'm at 54 Spalding Street. And my question is not knowing much about dimensions. Would you, in your experience, say that the dimensions of the proposed parking lot are appropriate for four cars and no more? So that's not jurisdictional to oh, us. Okay, all right. Yeah, so I don't know exactly who that would be, probably planning i don't know um yeah is it going before yeah. planning or zoning yeah it would be going to the zoning board of appeals okay so, so they could sorry. definitely answer that zoning board of appeals amy all right uh rob crowner fun i promote to Sorry, it's slow. Um, I'm Rob Kleiner, uh, 44 Spalding Street. I have uh, two questions about the last um, proposed condition. One is, what does it mean that um, the there's an expectation? Is it not mandatory? I, I feel like that, that should be um, tightened up. And second, um, there's two areas of plantings proposed. There's one right along the, the eastern edge of the parking lot, and then there's one that's uh, farther up for to shield headlights. If the condition is 50%, does that mean that the, the trees at the end of the driveway can die and the, and the rhododendrons can live? Or does that have to be 50% of each section? I would, I would suggest that uh, the condition require 50% at least of each section. 
So usually it would apply to all of the plantings as part of the permit. Um, and the reason that it is set as an expectation is because it's not part of our bylaws that apply to this permit. We have recently accepted revisions, moved through revisions to our bylaw where it is a bylaw. So in that case, we can immediately require it. Um, in this case, Doug, would you be okay moving forward with 50% survival of each species planted no. at the site? Okay, great. Seems very so, reasonable. Great, so we can move forward with that. Thanks for your question or comments. The Bob. first the first question that the gentleman had, could he clarify that a little bit? Because I wasn't, I didn't really catch what he was saying about not being mandatory. Um, it, it just says that the, the condition is, there is an expectation that such and such. That seems vague to me, but it was answered by, by the other, by the chair. Just like the use of language, Aaron and I was explaining that it, you know, we're in the middle of these by the bylaw transition. And so harsher, you know, more um, specific language could be used, but I think we've moved past it. It doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I ha had that right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rob. Any more comments or questions? Oh, okay. All right, Rebecca Cornell. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Rebecca Cornell, formerly Rebecca DeCourcy, and my family has uh, owned property on at 60 Spalding Street since 1961. Um, this project is before you because I have been complaining for 10 years to the town about this, 10 years. Um, so a couple of questions. I had number two in the conditions. Um, the, the property boundary should be clearly marked. Could that be changed to shall be clearly marked? Does that, um, do you have any problem with that, Doug? Shall be clearly marked? Um, nope, I mean, I, I think it's not the exactly the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission to determine uh, property boundaries, but it's not up to me to decide what you guys wanna put into condition. So I, if you guys find it reasonable, then I don't have a disagreement with you. Okay, I mean, the project boundary should be delineated for even just these plans. So I think asking that they're marked is not an overreach here. Aaron, do you have any trouble with this or any commissioners? Oh, sorry, Andre, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just saying that if uh, we say shall be, uh, we're, we are ordering it. That's what I'm asking, yes. Well, I don't yeah, think we have that authority. Say, okay. Um, my other question is the survival of plantings. Um, why can't it be 100%? Why is it only 50 or could it be 75%? I mean, I will say with all the problems we've had with um, these neighbors parking over the years, they do take, take good care of their lawn. And I don't think it would be a problem for them to maintain that. And then the plantings would have to be, maybe could be um, replaced when they died. Yeah, so it says the commission expects that 50% of the plantings will survive over a three year period. Otherwise, dead plantings will need to be replaced. So are you saying you want any dead plantings replaced, just to clarify? I think for three years, I think it's reasonable to have um, at least a 75% or 100% success rate of plantings, yes. So I, I think these property owners have the ability to do that. Yeah. So as background context here, our precedent and kind of industry standard is 50% over three years. Um, Aaron, do you have any further information on that or? I mean, I would say if, if Doug was comfortable with saying 75%, then I think that that's a reasonable, a reasonable ask um, just to up I, it. I don't, I don't think the applicants are going to be in disagreement with that. Okay, 75% would be appreciated. Thank you. Sure. Um, another question about snow removal. Is that within the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction for this project? Only yes. in terms of like where the, if the snow pile is, the snow 
wherever the snow is removed to cannot be within the 25 foot buffer. Um, so my so concern, not like whether or not it was removed, <laughs> that's not our jurisdiction, but where the snow is piled, if it is putting the resource at risk is our right. jurisdiction. Yeah. All right, we're on concern is the gravel driveway. So this is, um, this project is being related to a special permit that was issued over 10 years ago. And in that special permit, it was going to be impervious paving. And I know that prices have gone up, but if this work had been done 10 years ago, it wouldn't have cost as much as it would today. And um, I have doubts that that gravel is going to stay in place. Um, I have concerns. I mean, it can't be plowed, right? You really can't plow gravel right now. They snow blow their lawn, but how this property owners are aging. So how long is that really going to be realistic for them? Um, my suggestion was would be for them to explore options other than gravel. <clears throat> um, and then I have one other question for, um, for, for Mr. Serrell. You stated in your um, presentation that this is a duplex, but I know that there are three apartments there. So um, can you explain your, your statement and clarify that for us as a butters? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, the home is developed with two dwellings. So dwelling is there's three. Well, hold on, just let me uh, let me finish because I it, hopefully this will clarify it. Uh, but if not, certainly we're happy to happy to discuss. My understanding that there are there are two distinct dwellings, right? So that it is a duplex, a dwelling being with with um, within one of the dwellings, there are uh, lodging availability. So they're able to rent distinct rooms, but those rooms don't have kitchens. The kitchen's really the key thing that makes it a dwelling. So you're able to, you're able to rent uh, with, with, they have leases uh, for tenants or individual uh, uh, renters that are in the, the lodging situation, lodging or uh, rumors are uh, kind of the same name within the zoning bylaw. It's a little bit outside of the conservation commission, but for the sake of the, the point being that they, um, there are two dwellings then they, that are, you know, housing units, apartments that have uh, kitchens and, uh, you know, all it, that are independent uh, domiciles, uh, but the owner occupied residence, uh, uh, they are offering and they can do this, anybody can do this um, by right is, um, providing uh, uh, lodging or uh, uh, available space for roomers. They just can't have separate kitchens. They need to provide that same shared space. So they're choosing to do that and they are offering that to, to two individuals at this time. So there's a total of uh, six residents is our understanding uh, that are there, two in each uh, of the duplex units and then individual uh, renters in those to rooming operations. So because of that uh, 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 residency uh, arrangement, uh, zoning requests that there are six parking spaces for that. So that's why the plan is saying that because all of this is within the 100 foot buffer. And then part of this is within the 25 foot uh, wetland buffer. That's what brings us here to the commission. I My final question, when will this come before the ZBA? Um, don't know yet. You don't have a plan, you don't have a timeline? Well, we haven't submitted that application yet. That's in process. Okay, it's in process, thank you. Absolutely. That's all. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Okay. Um, great. Any other members of the public who would like to ask a question or make a comment? Please raise your hand. Okay. Oh, Karsten. Hello, this is Carson Tice, 26 Spalding Street. 
I wanted to ask about the logic of the three year time frame. Is the wetland only wetland for three years? Um, what do we do after three years if we see that the wetlands are impacted by the current stand, um, current status? So the permit is um, only valid for three years. Yeah. So the work can only be done while the permit is valid and the permit is only valid for three years. Um, I, so do you want to review kind of what happens at the end of a permit, Aaron, for the benefit? Right. Of? So, so generally once the work is done, um, and the site is fully stabilized, the applicant can file for um, a request for certificate of compliance. And so the commission can require as part of the certificate of compliance ongoing conditions. So let's say they finished the work within six months and applied for a certificate of compliance. We could have as a condition that we're monitored that plantings have to be monitored until the um, expiration of the permit for the survival. Um, there are situations where it's appropriate to have ongoing conditions. Like for example, if it's a commercial site and there's required maintenance and perpetuity of a stormwater management system or something like that, that requires specific um, management activities like regular cleaning and um, maintenance like that. Generally, those would be situations where there can be conditions that go in perpetuity, but in a um, residential, um, project like this, um, this is fairly standard. And so when a uh, property applies for a certificate of compliance, there is another site visit. And so there are situations where say the project was done in six months and Aaron, they applied for a certificate of compliance and Aaron went out and reviewed the property and it wasn't clear, you know, how those in, you know, those native plantings are doing, we can we can, um, like a condition that that be monitored and reported back at the at the end of the three year period, or we can not hold not issue the certificate of compliance until the end of the three year period. Um, so there are a couple options there, and it's something that we monitor. So we always have this permit. We always have these plans. We are going to always know exactly where these plantings happened and what the concerns were relative to the wetland. Um, so it's it's not something we let slide. Um, pretty detailed about that. Thank you. The other yeah. question I have is, I noticed that parking lots one through four are a little bit wider than five and six. I wonder, would it be possible to make those parking lots smaller so that there would be no uh, crossing of the um, line? So I, Doug, if you're comfortable answering that question, you can go ahead, but that is out of the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. Unfortunately, that would be a great question at if a permit is filed with the zoning board, that would be a great question at the ZBA hearing. Um, Doug, I'll let you decide on that. Um, I don't uh, quite understand you. because you're permitting that we are going into that zone. And if it's not necessary, then we shouldn't go into that zone, right? Yeah, but it's not our jurisdiction to determine how wide a parking spot has to be. Like, I really literally don't know. So it's it's not our job here is to say, is this a legitimate, you know, have their is this an okay use of this 206 square feet that's jurisdictional for us? Um, is the project doing everything they can to actually improve conditions on the site, which they are, they've gone above and beyond to put in additional um, plantings. And it sounds like really working with us to make sure that they're gonna survive. So there'll be not only a buffer, but also a native buffer on the site. Um, so that's our jurisdiction is to, to protect their resource. Um, okay. Thank you. We can't tell you how, how wide, unfortunately, as much as it can sometimes be frustrating. I echo that. A lot of the time we find ourselves asking like, why does this have to be so big? But that's not our jurisdiction. Um, so Doug, I'll let, if you have any comments on that, if you're willing to comment on that, go ahead. But otherwise. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to come here. I, I, you know, I realize it's, it's, it's outside of the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction, but the reason that the parking lot is the, uh, current size, um, uh, uh, I guess for a couple of reasons. One, it's my understanding, you know, minimum size parking space is to be um, uh, nine feet wide by 18 feet in, in depth. And so 
in this area, uh, giving a little bit of extra space around cars to make sure that they can come in and out uh, where there's not gonna be striping uh, in a gravel lot situation uh, helps to give people a little bit more room to move their vehicles uh, in and out of that space. Uh, the second part was that this uh, configuration of the lot was approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals back in 2007. So when we set forth to um, submit this notice of intent, we were following that previously approved plan. Um, it's fair to say this uh, is coming back to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And so um, it will be uh, requested to um, continue to, to build what they had previously approved. Um, but that's why the, this is currently uh, the size that it is. Thank you for the context. Sure, of course. Yeah. Um, and again, sorry, I'm sorry, I don't know this, Aaron and Doug, do you happen to know if abutters are notified as part of a permit filing for ZBA? Yeah. I believe, so I believe they are, absolutely. Yeah. That's so, state public meeting law. Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> so, um, Karsten, I don't, I don't know if you're an abutter. I don't remember your exact number, but certainly abutters, which would be your neighbors or you, would be notified when that permit is filed um, with okay. the Zoning Board of Appeals. All right. All right, I think last call on any um, questions or comments from um, members of the public in attendance about the hearing for additional parking at 51 Spalding Street. Just raise your hand. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Um, so, oh, oh, okay, thanks for pulling up the conditions, Aaron. I, Actually, would you mind not sharing just for one second because people are like raising their hands for can't see. Okay, so Fletcher, thanks for your patience. Did you have a question or clarifying comment or anything? Sure. Well, the first one was that lodger, um, the rent rooming thing. Anyway, that got clarified. Um, so Aaron, going back to when you said about the motion about bagging everything for the not, sorry, going to knotweed, uh, invasive plants here, you're up against a serious challenge your Doug and whoever else actually really does the contracting for this. Were you specifically talking about just cutting the, the plant and bagging it? Or were you specifically talking about digging out, trying to dig out the root system? So just that's cutting. Not, just cutting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, yeah, she, there, there's ways to do it, Doug, but you're, there's going to be, you're going to have a very difficult time and that's going to, um, and when, when we go to, when you're planting these native plantings to make sure survival happens, the knotweed's gonna come at you. So I was thinking, you got some, there's something you gotta think about pretty hard about how, that, how you're gonna tackle that. I'm just, I know you're, you're gonna have to come back with us as a WM4 or whatever, but um, I was just clarifying, Aaron, you weren't specifically talking about cutting and taking the soil out and bagging it. You were just talking about the plant. Okay, that's all I needed for, um, for clarification. Can I, can I comment to that? Yeah. Oh, great. Um, so uh, the, uh, uh, I guess, uh, officially, um, uh, we, we aren't asking to do that in this um, application, but um, it is, uh, it seems to make a lot of common sense, obviously, that that would be a condition to outline the kind of parameters, the difference between a manual removal like cutting versus needing a permit if there was herbicide treatment or something more more aggressive um, uh, or particularly chemical application because that requires having a like uh, applicator license. So um, so it's good for the homeowner to, to know that. Uh, they had a uh, sort of side note, they had um, uh, Carol uh, Albano had, had distinctly expressed uh, interest in that she would love to have more uh, native plantings just to support the wetland and the buffer. And uh, it, you know, she, she likes that aesthetic and likes all that, that the ecosystem services that that brings. And so she was, uh, she's excited about it. Um, so I think knowing like, for her to know that she doesn't need to submit a permit if she simply uh, cuts it and, and removes it, uh, I, think, I think she'll be enthusiastic to try to, um, try to remove that further. Where that's located on the property is further um, 
behind where the um, shrubs are proposed. So the first photo that Aaron showed where there was kind of an extensive lawn and then there was a perimeter of various plantings, the uh, gravel parking area extends further into that lawn. And then at the far Eastern end of that is where those uh, six uh, red osier dogwoods are proposed, but that's all still like basically a taking of lawn, not uh, extending into that uh, wetland vegetated buffer. So yeah, hopefully, I guess I say that just hopefully that the um, that that area doesn't have a large seed bank of Japanese knotweed, and that those plants, uh, you know, when that soil is disturbed, doesn't uh, open that sort of Pandora's box up. But I agree that the homeowners are going to have a real challenge uh, combating that plant. That plant is certainly aggressive for a reason. So yeah. So just to kind of clarify for the record that that condition is kind of um, precautionary and educational. So no actual hand cutting in the buffer is like part of this permit discussion. It's more that Aaron was anticipating that if the homeowner was interested in that, wanted to provide that information. Um, and just to repeat again, that where the proposed native plantings are, are again, to use Doug words, a taking of lawn. So the, we do not have to count on the knotweed not being there in order for these new plantings to come in and do their job as natives protecting the wetland, of course. Um, any other questions or comments, commissioners? Okay, um, so I think we're looking for a motion and I just wanna say I appreciate Aaron and, and Doug, the kind of back and forth and work that has gone on behind the scenes to bring this application up um, to this status. And again, I appreciate the, the um, clarity in the plan set, Doug. All right, looking for a motion commissioners. I move to close the public hearing and issue an order of conditions for 51 Spalding Street DEP number 089-0700 with the following conditions uh, that are listed um, listed there. Previously listed. Read all the uh, conditions or, sorry? I think just say previously, oh, I guess we had some edits. Well, the, I can just highlight that the changes were, I added in the snow storage um, can't be in the 25 foot buffer, the 75 point, 75% survival rate and um, those uh, it was shall delineate oh. border or the property boundary right yeah I, I wouldn't I wouldn't yeah I was I was a little bit on the fence on that one myself in terms of um, whether we should say shall there I don't think so our jurisdiction yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So I uh, move to close the uh, public hearing and issue an order of conditions on, for 51 Spalding Street, DEP number 089-0700 with the following conditions that we've uh, mentioned before and changes in uh, uh, the fact that snow cannot be stored in the 25-foot uh, 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 buffer zone and that the uh, native plantings uh, the uh, expectation of survival should be 75% instead of 50%. Uh, second. All right, that's a second from Fletcher, voice vote Fletcher. Aye. Andre. Aye. Larry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. And I'm an aye. All right, Doug, thank you. Yes, thank you all. Appreciate it. Good luck. Thank you very much. All right. So that is the end of our public hearings for the evening. Um, if you're here in attendance at the Conservation Commission meeting, um, waiting to hear updates on the projects um, proposed for 46 Bearing Street or for 395 West Street, those projects will both be continued until our next hearing, which is on scheduled for Wednesday, July 27th. So watch our website for an agenda um, where you'll see the scheduled time for those hearings. Um, 
All right. So, Aaron, do we have to have a motion to continue both of those? Yes. Why am I asking that? Okay. Yeah. So, commissioners, we're looking for a motion to continue public hearing um, for 46 Bering Street to July 27, 2022 at 7 45 p.m. So moved. Second. That was Michelle with the motion and Larry with the second. Voice vote, Larry. Aye. Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. And I'm an aye. And then we're looking for a motion um, to continue the public hearing for 395 West Street to July 27th, 2022 at 7.40 p.m. pending. Um, Revisions. Oh, that was an error. Review. They were just submitted. Yeah. Pending review <laughs> of revisions. Pending review of revisions. Thank you. I thought so. So moved. so moved. I think Larry got that one. Second. Thanks, Michelle. Michelle with the second. Voice vote, Larry. Aye. Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. All right. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm pulling up the agenda for this a little too bad. Other business correspondence. What I guess I should look at the PowerPoint, huh? Oh yeah. Right. So we need a motion um, to schedule an executive session uh, about the 52 Fearing Street DEP SORAD and whomever makes the motion should specifically read the language Aaron has posted on the screen. I move to schedule an executive session pursuant to GLC 30A section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to litigation at 52 Bering Street regarding recently issued DEP SORAD to be on 7-27-22 agenda. Second. We have a uh, motion for Michelle, second from Larry, voice vote, Larry. Aye. Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. And I'm also an aye. All right. Aaron, I looked through monitoring reports. I didn't see anything surprising. We're in a drought, so it's just going to be the next time we get a deluge that we have to worry. Right. <laughs> um, and I guess I should mention that the state actually just moved up to a level two drought. Um, so, and it's like moving quickly west into the Berkshire. So almost the whole state is in um, a drought, level two of four. Uh, yeah serious um so yeah so with respect to monitoring reports i don't think we're going to see a lot, a lot of concerns until our next big rainstorm um do you want to give us an update on these specific correspondences i did um i mean i i usually throw a bunch of stuff in the correspondence folder and i know there's a ton of stuff in there right now um but i wanted to just specifically point out two correspondence um so the Hickory Ridge Solar Project, um, they just basically submitted in their um, more or less just for your information that they um, plan to implement the Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program Conservation Management Plan that was approved as part of the Hickory Ridge Order of Conditions. And that does include um, uh, herbicide treatments to address invasive species on uh, Hickory Ridge. Um, in conversations, we've had many, many meetings with uh, AMP regarding the um, proposed uh, herbicide treatment to address the invasives. And that's part of the habitat management plan that was approved by Natural Heritage because the site is located in um, priority and estimated habitat. And 
um, I basically let them know that they should be providing some additional detail to us before that treatment takes place. Um, sort of similarly to the level of detail that was provided to us from Eversource for the treatments that were done on the right of way. So for example, um, precautionary um, steps that they're gonna take to protect wetlands um, during the treatments, um, who their licensed applicator is and their contact information, the um, chemical that they intend to apply on the site and um, uh, preferably the, the um, um, components that will be in the blend that they use, um, including the surfactants. So basically asked for sort of the same level of detail that was provided as well as where foliar spray is proposed versus cut and dab spray. So they're, they're aware that that level of detail needs to be submitted to us and they intend to provide that to us once they've identified an applicator. So I just wanted to introduce that to you guys remind you guys that that is going to be coming along, that that work is going to be done in the field, and I'll keep you informed um, once those correspondence are submitted to me as far as those details. Um, we also got, I also got an email from Paul Bockelman, and he was detailing some changes to the general bylaws with regard to the wetland bylaw, and this is no substantive change as far as what the bylaw actually protects or covers. Um, it's more so um, reorganizing and making the bylaw more efficient. Um, so like um, certain clauses aren't repeated again and again um, throughout different sections. Um, there's like a severability clause, which is referenced in like every individual section of the bylaw and they're just gonna do an, an entire severability section. And then there's a couple sections where things are sort of misplaced in weird sections. And I did go through those changes one by one and saw what he was talking about. And I didn't have any concerns with that. I responded to him and let him know that I thought that the changes made sense um, based on the recommendation of the bylaw review committee. So I just wanted to share that with you. I don't believe that there's any approval that's required from you guys for that. Um, I just mostly wanted to share it with you. So if you saw that the bylaw had been changed, that, you know, it was something that um, was on your radar screen and that it, you didn't get sort of skipped over in the <laughs> process. That's great. Thanks for handling all of that, Erin. Um, any other comments or questions, commissioners, about that? Okay. Oh, so, we know, um, sorry. Well, no, it's just like general business. Are, are we, is there um, any movement to replace Leroy? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, if anybody knows of folks who'd be interested in serving on the Conservation Commission, please encourage them to submit um, an application online. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <laughs> That's it. Okay. That's about all I can say Sounds about good. that. We are sure. we're on the hunt. So yeah. Cool. Well, Dave, Dave probably knows more, but we he's not here. So yeah, I mean, I know that we're there have been certain folks who we've been reaching out to to um, try to get them involved. Um, folks who've expressed interest in serving on boards and committees who have uh, conservation or ecology. Um, within their area of expertise. Uh, but certainly if there's other folks in the community who have that area of expertise and are and or interested in learning about it and um, applying the wetland laws, um, it's, a, it's a very um, fulfilling thing to do and you learn a lot and uh, it's a great way to serve your community. So please apply. <laughs> And I'll say like, you know, our best commissioners come from all kinds of different backgrounds because sometimes Absolutely. it's the expert in the field and sometimes it's just asking good questions. So um, I had a commissioner who was a jeweler. Right. And he was phenomenal. So, yeah. you know, it, you don't have to have it as your career or, you know, you know, your job. It can be a hobby or a side interest. Yeah. Thanks for the reminder on that, Fletcher. 
Any other general business questions or items? I think the 27th is probably going to be pretty stacked. So they all are, aren't they? Just a reminder, land use policy, if you haven't looked at it already, um, that if you have comments that you'd like to submit, and again, don't feel that you need to on this level, but if you have time and you want to at this stage, your comments are welcomed and I can try to get them integrated onto a single document for us to view um, on the 27th. And if it turns out that our meeting on the 27th is just overwhelmed with business um you know we can take that into consideration and um continue working on it and i certainly will continue to work on it behind the scenes oh and there was one thing i wanted to tell you guys that i almost forgot which is the culvert was replaced um at the kestrel land trust and it is so awesome and the timing of it was it couldn't have been better um the stop logs being removed, the dewatering of the stream, the replacement of the culvert, the final stabilization, <laughs> it's gone from being like this undersized dammed up um, area to being like a free flowing beautiful stream and I recommend that you guys go down there and take a look at it. Um, it's going to last probably through our lifetime so I'm really, That's really happy. Oh, great. Um, I drove by while they were doing the work and I saw Dave and his face looked like remarkably serene. And between that and my in-depth knowledge of hydrologic conditions, I was like, this is gonna be awesome. <laughs> but I, right. haven't, I haven't gone to see it yet. So congratulations. Yeah, it was the, the guy who did the work did an outstanding job. Um, we ended up having to dewater. Um, it was wetter than we had expected. But just the, the, the site conditions, um, the way that the, the, the way that that stream flows is really wonderful because it was flowing constantly. As soon as it goes under the driveway, there's another stream that feeds into it. So there was always stream flow. It was that one little section and it was dewatered literally for two days and then it was flowing again. So it was actually better than what we had expected because we were thinking it would be three to five days dewatered, but it only ended up being like two days dewatered and it was flowing again. So okay. we we're really happy. I mean, it couldn't have been better. The weather conditions were perfect. Um, so good job, everybody. It was a super team effort to get that accomplished and everyone really came through. So very happy about it and have a look when you go by. Awesome. Nice. Celebrate your celebrations. Right, that's right. <laughs> Um, okay, I think we're just looking for a motion to adjourn then. I'll do it. I'll make a motion <laughs> to adjourn at 8.44. Second. Uh, voice vote, Fletcher. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Larry. Aye. And also aye. Thanks everyone. Nice job.